Yes, there's a lot of females in this room. That's right. Okay, y'all have a seat. Thank y'all so much. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Aunt Day. Happy Grandma Day. Happy Friend Day, Sister Day, Cousin Day. You are making an impact in this world, and I'm honored to be able to be in a church with you and to walk beside you. It is my greatest joy. How many of you have ever had a like, major mom epic fail? Anybody in this room? My kid better not raise her hand. Yes, me too, me too, me too. Last service Rebecca was at the back and I was just waiting for her to like shake her head at me because I've had a lot of bad epic fails both of my kids have cut their hair anybody else kids cut their hair before by themselves please tell me I'm not the only one I'm the only one okay good okay good yeah perfect okay perfect yes I I love that actual kid raised her hand because she I'm not a kid teenager but I love that you said that both of my kids have cut their hair um Rebecca said she wanted to have tinkerbell bangs I'm not sure what that even means but the other one, um, Rachel got a hold of a pair of um, scissors at my mom's house. I'm going to blame my mom. And she got home. Just kidding. She got home, and she had big, huge clumps of hairs, like, coming out of her. And it was all in her car seat. But the other mom fell. I call it a dad fell because he was on his watch. I told last service. It was snowing once upon a time, and me and my sister were playing Scrabble, um, and my dad, we were playing Scrabble, and Rachel decides she's going to crawl right up into the fireplace and stuck her whole hand in the fire thing on Richard's watch, and so she stuck her hand in the fire, since off all of the entire part of her hand so much that a couple years ago she went to get her fingerprints for a job and they said you could rob a bank because you have no fingerprints so I was like okay maybe it was not a mom fail maybe it was the she could be the one arm bandit one day just kidding not saying that out loud but I just started thinking about it and you know one of the things that I know is that today I want you to be encouraged if you're a mom if you want to be a mom if you're, you're hurting deeply because maybe this is your first Mother's Day without your mom. Or maybe you desperately just feel like your kids and you have a terrible relationship. Or maybe you're an aunt or your grandmother. Wherever you are in this season, I want you to know that God sees you. And that today, I want you to know that there's no one else's mark on you except for God. His calling and design was on purpose for you today. So I want whatever, wherever you are, where you, where you feel like you're walking in a failure, failure or defeat, I want you to know that God sees you this morning. He truly, truly does. And by no mistake, are you a, a mom in this generation? Now, no mistake. It's not by mistake in any capacity that on this day in 2023 that you would be a mom in this generation. Nor is it a mistake that your dad or your grandma or your teenager in this generation. It is on purpose. So I want you to bow your heads with me. We're going to pray. Put your palms out in front of you like this. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you so much, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the opportunity, God, to share your word. I pray this morning, Lord, that for the woman in this room that feels so defeated, feel like she is limping through a season, God, would you meet her where she is this morning? Would you remind her of who you are? And who she is in you. Maybe for the single mom in this room. That just feels extremely lonely. Would you allow her to feel seen today? For the teenage girl in this room. Who wants so badly to make a difference. But doesn't even know where to start. Would you meet her where she is? For the, for the woman in this room. That feels so far from her spouse. Or from her kids. God would you meet her where she is this morning? I pray that you strengthen this church. And the core of who we are. Because we're ready to listen to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The beauty of God's word, y'all, is that whether you're a woman in this room or a mom in this room, 
you can walk out of here being different because God's word is what transforms, transforms you. It'll be nothing that I said. It will only be what he says, right? All right. How many of you guys have ever tried on something that didn't fit? Anybody in this room? Okay, so I want you to imagine like you walk into a shoe store, you have the perfect outfit in mind, but then you cannot get the shoes to fit. It looks something like this, okay? Anybody in this room? Anybody in this room, okay? And you push and you push and you push because you need those shoes to fit, right? And so you walk out of there with the shoes half size too big or half size too, sm too small. I have so done that. My mom has said, do those fit you? You know, when your mom bends down and she puts her thumb on your toe. I don't know what that even does. On your toe to see if there's any room. Well, I have slid my toe up so to the front just so I can get those shoes, right? Or I'll push it real far back to the back of the heel just so I can get those shoes. And they didn't fit. And there's times in our lives where things in our lives, like friendships or relationships or their thought processes, they don't fit where you are. Okay? Maybe you have a kid who has ever played with this kind of toy. Anybody know that toy? Where your little kid is like banging the triangle, trying to get into the circle, and you want to let them grow a little bit, so you let them bang a little harder. Then you're like, hey, let me just show you. This goes over here, right? There's people in this room this morning, you were trying so hard to change who you were created and designed to be. And God wants to meet you this morning to say, hey, I have created and designed you. I want to get glory for your life. I want to be the one that when people look to you, they're going to see me. But I want you to walk in who you created to be. Or what about, how many of y'all eat just one Pringle when you stick your hand in a Pringles can? Anybody just eat one Pringle? Last night, one person. You're right. This is Richard. He sticks his whole hand into the Pringles can. You know what I'm talking about? And you bring out like 15 Pringles at one time. You know you're not going to put that whole, well, Richard may, put that whole thing into your mouth like this, right? But we want this idea in our minds. It just doesn't fit, right? We can't just have one. In our minds, culture has created this idea, this monster of more, that more, more, more is going to be what takes us and fulfill, fulfills us. It's not, right? It doesn't fit. Or what about this? How, have you, how many of you have ever stuck your head in places it wasn't meant to be? Anybody? Stuck, anybody's kids stuck their head in the toilet? I really want to know this. Okay, you're probably just too embarrassed. It's okay. You're not a failure. It's not you're not a failure. Rebecca, when she was small, she stuck her leg in a chair with the bars in it, and she's playing zoo, and she stuck her whole leg all the way through the bar that Richard almost had to break the chair to get her leg out of it. Again, it was on his watch, not mine. However... He's going to come for me Father's Day. I can already feel it. It's one of those things where a lot of you are sitting in this room and you're overcome by shame and guilt this morning. You feel like a lot of the things that you've already done, that you feel like a mom failure. Or maybe you're in this place of you're, you're attached to insecurities or attached to this idea or perception of perfection. And you're never, ever going to get there. You're not. But what I want you to hear me say this morning is this. That failure isn't a sign that you're failing. It's a sign for where your faith has a space to grow deeper. Let that sit for a minute. You're not a failure. Look at your neighbor and say, you are not a failure. You're not. Now, have you have your scripture? Go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to be there for a little bit. You know, one of the things that I love about when we fail and when we allow our kids to, to fall and to get back up there's something about that space that is so sweet that creates this intimacy to call you to a place for deeper growth, right? It just generally does. It's in those sweetest spaces that God says, I'm going to blue something brand new in this space, but I need you to get your eyes off what you, where you want to go. Get your eyes onto me and allow me to prepare you and ready you for what is to come. He hasn't forgotten you. He will not forsake you. He will not leave your kid or you in a season. But he wants your eyes completely onto him. He wants your eyes on him, but we have to make space for him. Let's look at verses 4 through 9 in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be a frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Y'all, this passage is so jam-packed full of truth. 
in the in this whole entire thing, this was a passage that the Jews, the Jews, I am all over the place. I need some water. G, the Jews considered to be one of the most important texts in the Old Testament. Unreal. Everything about this entire thing, Moses had one belief in God. He knew that everybody had one belief in God, but he wanted everybody else to preserve that belief to keep going forward. So this passage is very, 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 very important in the Old Testament. Very important. Because it's referred to something called the Shema. And what that means is, when you hear that first word, hear, O Israel, it wasn't just, hey, listen in. It was listen and obey. Listen and obey. It is so important for you to understand. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I didn't do this in the first service. It's because I talked too much, y'all. Okay. Did y'all hear my husband say amen? Did y'all hear realize it's Mother's Day? Okay, let's get back. So the first thing that I want to, to press down on your heart this morning is this. You have to surrender your heart fully. There's so many of you in this morning in this room, and you're limping, and you're having these doubts, and you're walking in this place of defeat. And the Lord says, I want you to surrender your heart fully to me, fully to me. God chose you for such a time as this to be a mom. He chose you for this t- such a time as this to be a teacher, to be a nurse, to be the one that worked in that machine shop right now, to be a stay-at-home mom, to work in the coffee shop, to be a student. In order for God, for God to use you and do what you're called to do, you've got to start with a heart check. Surrendering him fully means totally committed in the Hebrew language. When it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart means totally committed to God. Totally committed to God. In every area of your life, are you seeking the Lord this morning? Are you seeking him for the answers that you need in the next season? Are you reading God's word? Are you prayed up? Is church a priority for you right now? Are you developing healthy rhythms and habits in your life all those things go back to the place of the condition of our hearts we have to seek the lord exactly where we are and if you're in a season of drought are you seeking him this morning if you're in a season of wilderness are you seeking god this morning if you're in a se- in the area of like you're like god i don't even know what my next steps are are you seeking him this morning Because that's where it comes to have the fullness of our hearts locked in on our eyes on the cross and who Jesus is. And no matter what comes on the other side, understanding and embracing that he is faithful and he will not forget you. So surrendering your heart fully this morning. Look in verse 4 and 5. It says, one more time. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God and the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Verse 6 is, and and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You know, everything about our hearts matter. The reality is that habits that we have right now, we're passing them on to the next generation. We're passing them on to our kids, whether it be grit by fear or addiction or worry or approval or perfectionism. We do those things when we allow these rhythms to become who we are, not identify us, but shape us. When we allow the first thing in our mind to run in that place of worry, we're creating that idea and that rhythm for our kids to run in that direction as well. So asking yourself this morning, God, am I seeking you with my whole heart? And I promise you, if you ask him, he's going to show you where you're not. Because it's easy to come here on a Sunday morning and to worship him. It's easy to show up at Bible study and to lean in and hope to get a truth from him. But sometimes on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday, it'd be so much easier to do what you want to do, right? It's true. Our, our minds lean in that direction. So with all your heart, are you totally committed? Stand firm. Are they seeing you stand firm? Are they seeing you lean in that direction of faith and trusting God? When a diagnosis comes, I know many of you know Richard last year had a massive heart attack, had triple bypass surgery. It was right around this time. He had to go back into the hospital, and his the two of the four stents had collapsed. Well, about a month ago, we ended right back up into the hospital again. He's been having a little bit of symptoms here and there. So we go in, they do x-rays, they do checks, they do everything at all. And they finally did a heart cath and they said, Richard, your four main arteries, three of them are blocked. Two of them are 80%, one's at 40%. We can't really do anything for you except give you medication. 
y'all, last year I should have fallen apart. This year I should have fallen even more apart. And our girls have, I mean, over and over, Rebecca has cried multiple times. Rachel's been so anxious about it. And they were like, why are you not worried? And I looked at Rebecca last week and I said, Rebecca, the peace that surpasses all understanding, I have to lean into that, that my God is a healer, that my God is not finished with my husband, that my God is not finished with his calling. I know this to be true. I know it. I believe it with my whole heart. And that's the thing is if our kids see us go into these rooms and these hospital rooms or they see us when things fall apart with finances or whatever it is, they see you fall apart, then what kind of does it look like for the God that we serve that we say who he is? What are we saying about our God? We have to understand and embrace the literally total commitment, fully surrendering our heart means a bow before a holy father and just bowing to him. It can't be that we bow to a diagnosis. It can't be that we bow to our kids. It can't be that we bow to a sport. It can't be that we bow to anything other than a holy God. So number one, surrender your heart fully, y'all. Because here's the thing. We have everything we've been given in Christ Jesus. In Galatians, it says this in 523, 24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. You have everything you need in Christ to be the follower of Jesus he's called you to be. And you can say all day long, I don't have self-control, but you have to seek the God who gave you that fruit. Those things were gifts to us. And what happens, we begin to compartmentalize these gifts. Well, I love everybody, but I have no self-control. That's an oxymoron. That's not true. If you are a believer of Christ, then God has gifted you with the fruits of the Spirit. So self-control is in you. Kindness is in you. Faithfulness is in you. Joy is in you. But you can't compartmentalize and you can't keep compartmentalizing God when he is gifting you the very things to follow him wholeheartedly. He wants you to lean in that direction. He wants you to exercise those fruits. Because our actions, y'all, tell the story of the condition of our hearts, don't they? You can talk to someone for five minutes and know exactly where they stand. If you bring up any issue, anything at all, you can know where people stand in just a few minutes. In Luke 6.45, it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What comes out of your mouth is a direct reflection of where your heart is. It just is. So surrender your heart fully. Resolve to totally commit to the king of kings. And number two, sharpen your sword. Sharpen your sword. Look at verse 6 and 7. It says, In these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. The first thing that pops out at me is teach them diligently. Y'all, in the Hebrew and the Greek language, when, in the, for this passage of Scripture, the word teach diligently is like a metal sharp object that's being carved into some cemented stuff to put an image, to put something, words, something on an image that's permanent for generations to see. Teaching the truth diligently to a generation that's coming against them, that's saying there is no more truth, is hard. Am I right? Yes. Teach them diligently. It's words cut with metal into the stone for permanence. It makes sense now to me. The conversations that I have with teenage girls, the conversations that I have with with wives, it makes so much sense when I see videos on social media. It makes sense. The enemy is coming for this generation. He's coming for the truth. And I better, with everything in me, heed to this command. This is not just a suggestion, y'all. This is a command. When Moses was trying to say, there's one true God, there's one God, believe in one God. Now, I'm going to say this as a command so that you preserve that belief. We're in a generation where that belief is one of the many thousands of beliefs, right? We're there. We're at that place. No wonder it's so hard for us to, to exercise our faith muscle. It is hard. It is so hard. But, y'all, if you don't know the truth, you can't pass on the truth. And if you don't live out, you can't, if you don't believe the truth, your truth you're not going to live it out. So we have to make sure we resolve, number one, to surrender fully, but to sharpen our swords, which is the word of God. 
we do that, and what happens, it comes into us, and it begins to cut away the things that don't fit, right? The things we talked about earlier in the, all our pictures, the things that don't fit, things like insecurities don't fit. Because God didn't create you to be insecure. He created you to be a warrior in boldness for him. There's things inside of you that God created, but you're allowing it to be dull down. Your shine to be dulled because of things of, by the things of this world. These verses is the idea that we're passing it from generation to generation. And that means mom and dad and grandma and friend, you have to speak hard things. Hard conversations have to follow. They just have to follow. Teachable moments. Discipline on your part has to follow. Sharpening our swords means there's things that have to be cut away from our heart, from our thought process, from how we speak. So that we can look more and more like the Father. So that the next generation can see the Father. It's so true. The Bible is sharp. It says it. And it's like a double-edged sword. It cuts away, y'all. It cuts away the things that don't belong or fit. It just does. YouTube is teaching your kids. TikTok is teaching your kids. Instagram, Facebook, it's teaching your kids whether you believe it or not. It's teaching you whether you believe it or not. From cooking to traveling to parenting to who God is and who he's not, how birthday parties should look, sexuality, your style, it is shaping and molding. And don't you know that the enemy is strategic in that? He is strategic in everything that he does. And just like the word of God cuts away and molds and shapes us, the enemy comes in in his slinky, slimy little self and begins to cut away the truth. Did God really say that? He comes in and puts a thought and says, you know what? not good enough you're you're never going to be a good mom didn't you see so and so on facebook her kid sleeps four hours a day your kid never sleeps and all of a sudden a lie takes root and you begin to believe the lie that you were never intended to believe and church we have to resolve to believe god's word you have to get to that place you have to believe that god's word is true and then no longer choose to compromise that's on, that's on me. That's on Richard. That's on leadership. That's on you. That's on the Big C Church. Did you know that the average age for a girl to go on a diet is now the age of eight? Did you know that? It used to be 12. Girls' ministry has always been a passion for mine. But yesterday, we were had a little girls' event called In Bloom here for all like, the little bitty girls. And y'all watching them and hearing them and talking to their sweet moms who drove two hours from Asheville to get here from Columbia with tears in their eyes for their eight-year-old girls to tell me that they feel fat every day broke my heart. And the average age is, a 12, is, is eight years old. But you know what the, pedi- the pediatrics are now saying for parents to talk to their kids about sex? The age of five. Why? Because the world is telling us what it is and what it is not. And it's crazy to me that most kids by the age of 7 have already been exposed to pornography. 60% between 11 and 13 have already seen it by accident. 93% of between 14 and 18 year old guys seek it out. And 64% of those females seek it out. Yo, we're in a massive battle against the enemy. And there's a strategic plan for you, 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 you. And the only thing we have to fight back with is the sword of God, which is the word of God. That's all we have is truth. It's not your feelings. It's not your opinions. It's the word of God. That's all we have, and it has to stand up against it. That's the only thing that will defeat it is that. It's that. It truly is. And I think over and over again, this idea that somehow that we're, we have to be friends with our kids. I don't know where that my kids will tell you. Like, I'm friends with them now because they're in their 20s. But we aren't supposed to be friends with our kids. We're just not. If you can show me anywhere in Scripture, I will change my stance. But God chose me to be Rebecca and Rachel's mom. And then I have to fully surrender my heart and fully surrender them. You know, a couple years ago, we were at the beach. We'll say they were, they were younger. And we were out on the ocean, and Rebecca and Rachel came up, and it was like Shark Week stuff. And they were like, Mom, what well, if the shark eats us? And I was like, that would be so cool, wouldn't it? They were like, Mom. I'm like, I committed you to the Lord a long time ago. That would be awesome. 
Just kidding. But I want them to hear me say is that God is sovereign over everything. From life to death and all in between, he is sovereign and he never, ever gets off the throne unless you remove him. That is the beauty of it. Y'all, is God is sovereign. And there's nothing that I can do to change the word of God because when God spoke it, it exists. Look at verse 7. It says, you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Talk about it. Walk with a purpose. Morning, noon, and night. That's what I heard. That's what I see so clearly. Like, how, how do we do this? This is not a suggestion. It's a commandment. It's a command for us to teach the next generation what truth is and to walk in it. That word walk the, the original language is obedient life. Are your kids of the next generation or those around you seeing you walk in obedience? Do they see how you spend your money? Do they see how you talk? Do they watch how you complain or you're negative? What are we putting into them? What are we depositing into them? Do we pick apart things? Our first response is to run to, the, to worship and to praise the Father regardless of our circumstances. Or do we shrink back and throw our fists at God? And our kids say, well, why should I trust them if you don't trust them? We have to surrender our hearts fully. Sharpen our swords. And number three, we have to stand firm. Look at verses 8 and 9. It says, you shall write them on the doorpost of your house. I'm sorry. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and your gates. And you hear, you hear that, and you're like, all right, how do we stand firm, Holly? It will just told us. Put Jesus in front of everything you do. We can't change their minds, and we can't make them be who we want them to be. But we can keep Jesus in front of them at all times. If it means putting post-it notes of Scripture all over your house, then do it. If it means having awkward conversations in the car, like what's God doing in your life right now? Are you reading God's word? Push through that awkward and let the holy happen because the Holy Spirit is what's going to transform your life and your kid's life, not you. The awkward is just a conversation that may just need to happen. Putting it in front of your kids because we have to stay prayed up so that we can rise up so that we can raise up. It is literally, if we know this passage of scripture is saying, hey, here. And obey this. Now take it to the next generation. Then it, I better be prayed up. I better run to the Father when my kids are falling apart, when my husband's falling apart, when my friendships are falling apart, when things I need to know that I am prayed up. Standing firm, that scripture, when we talk about being steadfast in the spirit, means almost like a cemented feet that's not moving. Nothing can knock you down because you're standing in the word of God. Do you fall, but you stand back up? The steadfast to be able to stand firm is saying, I'm going to resolve to fully commit my heart to the Lord. That I'm going to sharpen my sword. And that I'm going to stand firm in Jesus. But we have to, y'all. We have to. Because here's the thing. Everything in this world is coming against your, your, your kids' minds. I get it. I know it. I hear it. I see it. On Sunday mornings, I hear their prayer request. I hear the things that make their feelings hurt. I hear them talk about things. I sit in a group on Thursday nights of high school teenage girls. We're doing the armor of God, and they tear up. And they're fighting the, a battle in schools where a lot of people do not believe. They're trying so hard to, to be steadfast in the spirit. And I know every time that I leave them, every single time I leave them, I get in the car almost like with this urgency in my soul because they're about to go to college, half of them. And I don't want them to walk in the direction that has anything to do with this world. And as a church, we have got to resolve to say, I'm going to choose to trust God. I'm going to choose to believe God's word. And that I'm going to carry that torch of truth so the next generation can come too. We have to, y'all. We have to. Did you know that one out of five now attend church post-pandemic? One out of five people. Only 20% go every single week. 20%. And we're on the Bible Belt, so we know we get more than most. When I was looking at the statistics, I was blown away. I was blown away. 
But choosing to stead, be steadfast is going to offer, it's going to come from a place of sacrifice. Because could you imagine 20% right now? What about when my grandbabies are on the scene? Or what about five years from now even? Will churches be empty? God's bigger than that. And I believe that God is stirring something so powerful right now in his believers. On Monday nights and staff, we always celebrate the things that are coming. And every week, we're holding a stack full of new visitor cards. So harvest is coming. It's here. But we have to get to a place where we are choosing to believe that this is the word of God. And I'm going to do whatever I can to hold on to it. That word sign, when it says in verse 8, it says, You shall bind them as a sign. means promise to remember. On your hand. In front of your eyes. Write them on the doorpost. Getting truth in front of you at all times, but even more getting your tr the truth in front of the next generation. Your kids, your three-year-olds to your 20-year-olds. Putting it in front of you at all times. Writing it on their hearts means first you have to know it. You've got to lean into it. You've got to resolve to believe it and resolve to walk in it. But you know, sacrifice is hard and it's holy. And I understand that. I think about the story of Esther over and over again. And I can't imagine the fear that she felt. She was born an orphan. Yet she's finding herself shaking on the insides, having to go into the throne room to see the king. Will he accept me to come forward? It's against the law to approach the king. It was against the law. She had to sacrifice for hard and holy for her people. Are you willing to sacrifice hard and holy for the sake of your children or the next generation for comfort, for sports, for academics? Are you willing to do that? The YMCA did a huge poll about top three reasons why kids, they put their kids in sports. And I'm not bashing sports, play sports. The top three reasons were this. Make friendships, develop communication skills, and to give them a sense of community. That's the church's job. That's what churches do. So yes, do sports, but make sure that you do whatever you can to put your kid to make church a priority because they're going to get this, but also soul care. They're going to see biblical community from a completely different perspective, which means sometimes parents, you have to say no. Rebecca was in, when she was in high school, she played soccer and we were doing student ministry at the time and we just couldn't, we could watch the first part of her games and we'd have to leave because we had student ministry on a Wednesday. And it got to the point where we're like, okay, you have to, you have to come. Like you have, you, you can't, we can't come back and pick you up. Mom all's in church. Everybody's in church. They can't get you. So she said, okay, she, she agreed to it. So she would leave right after halftime for us to get to student ministry on time. And her coach made her run laps. She had to do push-ups. She had to do sit-ups. But I didn't care because I needed her to understand that God comes before anything else. And that's not making us a good parent. We had to. We didn't have another option. We both were going to be at church. But I'm so glad that I did that because she talks about that to this day. We had a conversation about it just recently. She talks about it. Thank you for doing that. Because we're, so we're not careful. We can create things to become idols in these kids' lives, and we don't even meant to do that. What we created for community now can become an idol if you're not careful. And you begin to bow down to things and battle things that you were never intended to battle on this side of heaven. If it doesn't align with God's word, walk away from it. If you see that it's calling your kid to go in the opposite direction of obedience and truth, hard conversation, no. Sometimes the answer is just no. It's just no. I truly believe we're at a place where you can fill in the blank. Let go of blank while you reach for holiness. We're in a new season that we have to begin as we're running this race. And just like in our track meet, when there, somebody is running with the baton, that person never looks back to give the baton. Their eyes are where they're headed. 
And they hold the baton back knowing that the next person is going to grab it from them. Who's behind you this morning? Are you even looking in that direction? Or are you looking in that direction? Because the moment you veer your eyes, you're slowing the whole thing down. And the truth of God's word has been handed to you, commanded to you to take it to the next generation and the next generation. And there's some things in your life this morning that aren't going to fit that need to come out. And maybe it's a thought process. Maybe it's the way that you speak to your kids. Maybe the way you speak to other people. Maybe it's compassion. Maybe it's holiness. But God has called us to this place. Maybe it's letting go of fear this morning so that you can embrace holiness. Maybe it's letting go of unbelief so that you can embrace holiness. Maybe it's letting go of defeat or pornography or wanting a baby more than you want God or walking and healing or your thoughts. I don't know what is stirring in you this morning, but I know there's ache. I know there's heartache. I know there's hurt. I know there's, there's places in you that they're longing for God to meet you exactly where you are. And we're, we need to seek after that. So if you'll bow your heads with me this morning.